Hello everyone, good morning and welcome to our latest webinar. Thanks for joining us. My name is Rob Newton, I work here at Visual Impact and today we are discussing the exciting topic of shooting in extreme conditions and we've got a real expert on our hands here live from New York, uh, a guy called Phil Coates. Some of you may know of him, Have, he's done quite a lot of presentations etc on this topic and he is a really fantastic guy and um, you're in for a treat really, which is brilliant. Phil, if, for people who don't know, is a filmmaker, producer, director, cinematographer and Canon ambassador and as I say he's been specialising in this field for over 25 years so it's good to have him here today to, show, to share his vast knowledge and experience. Um, you may not know, but we run open days and masterclasses here in Teddington, where you can come in and get your hands on the kit. Um, all of the information for that is on our website, visuals.co.uk, for details. And if you want to see Phil talking and talk to him directly about the event and actually um, have, have the event here in person, that's going to happen on the 8th of March here in Teddington. I'll be putting details on our website soon. So as I say, if you want to talk to him directly and share some of his experiences, then you can do that on March the 8th. Um, and as I say, take great pleasure in handing you over now to Phil, who will go through the amazing things that he's been doing over the last few years. Over to you, Phil. Thank you very much, Rob. Uh, really appreciate that. Uh, hello, everybody from uh, New York. Yeah, what I'd like to do now is literally jump right into the deep end and in particular the cold end. Um, as you say Rob, I've spent 25 years working in extreme locations but I think most importantly what I've done is built a reputation of being able to look after myself and look after the equipment in very cold and very demanding uh, environments and this is one of them. It's extreme cold but actually kind of paradoxically working in extreme cold is, from my experience certainly, one of the easiest to work in. Uh, and when I say extreme, I'm talking about temperatures down to minus 25. Tw minus 25 and below, that's a whole different ball game, that's a whole different kettle of fish. But the great thing is, is that down to minus 25, it's dry. Life is sweet, life is simple and relatively, it's relatively straightforward to keep yourself comfortable and your cameras working and in particular with today's modern lithium metal hydride batteries they're relatively easy to keep um, warm and safe so you can operate your cameras out of the box in these conditions. Clearly though you need to work um, at maintaining your kit when you're working with a team of polar explorers. And here I am, this is a shot from the um, Catlin Arctic Survey. This was an international multidisciplinary research expedition. And what we were trying to do is find out exactly what was happening under the Arctic sea ice. Uh, literally trying to understand the physiology of the Arctic Ocean. What's going on there with the temperatures of the water just below the ice surface? Huge uh, international projects had happened before, looking at ice extent, but no one had really, before this time, looked at the ice thickness and what was going on underneath that sea ice. Well, this pioneering expedition um, five years ago was exactly doing that and what I'm doing now with Wild Bear TV in Australia is bring the whole project up to date in a, a new international co-production called Polar Meltdown and I've got a, a specialist oceanographer on board and we're bringing the whole subject right up to date. Now it's all well and good looking at the science, looking at the theory but this is the practicality this is the terrain I had to work in. I had to pull my production equipment over day after day after day for 10 weeks. It was unrelenting. Here we've got some glacial ice as an iceberg, but it's just a huge interconnected field of rubble. And I had to pull my sledge over this kind of stuff 
pretty much day after day. Thankfully, now and again, we get flat plans of ice. But don't forget, the Arctic is an ocean. It's a frozen sea. It's dynamic. It constantly moves, constantly shifts. And I had to figure out a way of how I could film this production, living with them cheek by jowl, get every second on camera. And I come up with this system. I had a chest pouch taking my first, my principal camera, the Canon uh, XF100. I was one of the first British cameramen to actually use these new cameras. Canon had shipped them over uh, on air freight directly from Japan for me. So I could test them before I took them out on the, uh, on the Arctic Ocean. And they supplied additional batteries and, and cables and leads. But you see the sledge behind me. I'd, um, rather than taking pelly cases, I used the superstructure of the sledge. Uh, it's made of Kevlar. It's the same stuff as Formula One racing cars. And I use this to protect all my spare cameras and my microphones and camera gear, literally all my production gear. And at the start line, I was towing 111 kilograms worth of kit. But one of the great advantages of these Kevlar sledges, they, um, they were able to float. And therefore, we could raft them together and go in between the leads uh, of ice. So this is where the ice breaks up. The tensions of wind and the polar currents, this, the ocean currents, uh, break up the sea ice. And you end up getting open water like this. So paradoxically, a very dry environment, but equally a very wet environment. And to be honest, Britain in winter, so the conditions that you've got now, uh, and in particular, I'd say Britain in northwest Scotland in winter, from years of filming around the world, I can honestly say they are the hardest conditions they are. If you can film up in Scotland in winter, you are hard as nails because you're experiencing wet cold, it freezes, it thaws, it freezes, it melts. Repeat the process, repeat the process, repeat the process. Basically, it's conditions that will break you and your camera. So here I'm using a totally waterproof little mini cam, a little action cam. Um, big problem with those small cameras with internal batteries like GoPros and other action cams. They've got internal batteries. That's an absolute mare because you've got very limited battery life in cold conditions. But that's cold, but not that as cold as this. Minus 52 Celsius. I filmed the sequence on the Canon XA10. And when I went out of the tent, it was minus 30 Celsius. As I was filming, and you can see that this, this was early in the season, the sun was going down. Um, it was got down to kind of minus 43 on my thermometer. That's the last time I looked at it. By the time I packed up the camera, just finished the filming, the sequence, gone into the tent, the temperature had fallen off a thermal cliff. It was minus 52 Celsius. And you might ask, how on earth do I operate a camera in those conditions? What I managed to do is use huge down mitts. I keep warm. But then I use a pen stylus, and it was a dear friend of mine, Kevin O'Gello, that just the day before I flew out to Canada uh, for this project, he, he reminded me to take uh, pen styluses. So I, hurriedly, I made them out of big biros, and I had them in loads of pockets. And what you do is you use the stylus just to be able to push the buttons of your camera while you're still wearing huge mitts. Um, and talking of mitts, it's all a matter of how you look after yourself. It's personal clothing, super important. Breathability is the key. Otherwise, you're going to perspire and sweat into your clothing, and that will freeze instantly, creating kilograms of ice. And ice, as we know, doesn't insulate. What we need is still dry air around our bodies. And paradoxically, what happened on this project, I ended up cutting out all the additional insulation out of my clothing. So I, it could breathe as much as possible. 
as soon as I stopped, so as soon as I stopped moving and exercising, I'd put on a huge down jacket, and that kept me nice and warm and toasty. But most importantly, I wasn't overheating uh, while I was moving. But generally speaking, we don't have that problem with cameras. Cameras tend not to overheat at minus 30 and minus 50. What they can do, though, and freeze solid. Uh, and most people will go, well, you don't want to take your camera into the tent. But you know what? I had to take my cameras into the tent because I was wanting to film all the action that was going on how to survive in these conditions. So it wasn't just all the beautiful images, it was actually what it takes to live and work in one of the most hostile and extreme locations on the planet. And the other weird thing is when you're working in the cold, how do you show the cold? Uh, it's a really strange concept because what happens is that generally when you've got gorgeous blue sunny skies, it's actually colder and when you've got polar blue windy conditions it's warmer so the cloud brings the uh, pressure, low pressure system, it's warmer and when you've got clear blue skies and, and gorgeous sunshine it's colder. So some of the techniques I get is how to show frosting on the face, I alluded to this before um, I'm trying to get details of snow and windblown spin drift. So it's all the little nuances, it's all those little subtleties that make all the difference when you're filming in these conditions. It's not just a matter of the big pretties. Um, my currency is all about emotion. So how on earth am I going to film something, it's film ourselves when we're on the go, when we're actually doing this science? Well, I devise this. I always love kit that has got more than one purpose, so it looks a bit Heath Robinson, I must admit, but it was bloody effective, it worked, it was fantastic. And it's a um, Manfrotto carbon fiber monopod, here we've got the little Canon uh, x a ten, and I put a wide angle adapter lens on it, and the thing works, it's a selfie cam, we could ski, um, do our work, and film ourselves. And the great thing is, you can see all the detail around our faces. Just having a drink of water, it's a quarter past six here in the morning, so I've had my coffee, but I need to keep my throat going. Um, and it was fantastic. It got some gorgeous, intimate material. Now, it's all well and good talking about getting those shots, get, wearing the right clothing, but if your cameras don't work, nothing happens. You know, let's face it, we're in the production business, we need to get footage. So, modern cameras, it's all about power, all about battery life. So, <clears throat> as you can see on this image, I had special build external lithium batteries produced. They can operate down to minus 40 Celsius. And then what it did is ensure that I'm getting the biggest available batteries for the given camera. One of the amazing things is with the XF100, and I still use them for a lot of productions these days as a second camera, the XF100 takes very little power. All solid state, recording onto compact flash, and using these broadcast Canon 975 batteries, these intelligent lithium ion batteries, I could get fantastic power consumption from them. It worked beautifully. And then uh, one super important thing in the cold you've got to consider is a media and workflow. Now, it's all well and good here, me doing posing for a photograph for, for SanDisk uh, using their extreme uh, CF cards, but you wouldn't catch me swapping cards in the open, trying to do this, trying to manipulate those CF card doors um, at minus 25 and below, not a chance. So what I did is rather than swap out the uh, cards, I swapped out cameras. And as you can see, this one has got red tape, red-orange tape on the handle, and I had two cameras. I had a red and a green, 
and I used to just swap them between the two. Admittedly, <clears throat> on occasion, it had issues with time code, but you know what? That's why you have bloody good editors back home uh, that can sort these things out. Last not but not least, in the cold, and this is just before I go on to another area and another kind of case study, communications. Um, vitally important when you're working in remote locations and extreme conditions. You need reliable communications. It's imperative. Now, Iridium phones are fantastic, but the, the battery life is very limited. Thankfully, Iridium have brought out a new extreme phone, um, which can cope with the cold much better. But here we are um, at the geographic North Pole, just south of the geographic North Pole, making the most northerly live link into a news feed. This was going direct into a news, uh, live news story for CNN. And we were doing it on an Iridium Mini M. So it's equivalent to four sat phones, all side by side. So you've got the bandwidth of four sat phones. So what I'd like to do now, Rob, if, if we've got any questions in, pertaining to, to cold environments, I'm more than ha happy to ask, uh, to answer a couple uh, before I move on to the next area. If not, I can move straight on. Yeah, we, uh, we've got a couple of questions here. One is about um, keeping the cameras warm. Have you got any special techniques of keeping them warm rather than them freezing in, in those conditions? Or, or is, is it just a matter of wrapping them in, in, in blankets or whatever? So critical thing is, so the question was keeping the cameras warm, what I try and do is keep them at the ambient temperature. Um, so if I'm operating down to minus 25, I'll operate with the camera down to minus 25. Beyond that, it kind of gets into its own realm because uh, the weak link is LCDs. Uh, and any moisture. So the critical thing is keep them dry rather than warm um, because inevitably they will cool down. On a, on a project like this, I was out on, the loca on location for 10 weeks, it was impossible keeping the cameras warm for that duration. If you're in a, in a what I call an acute cold environment where you're working, say, at a research station, or working at a, you know, you've got a hotel base, you go out into the cold, then yes, you do have an advantage of keeping the camera warm. But the effort required to do that on a long-term project like this was irrelevant. What I did do in extreme conditions is keep the batteries warm. I'd keep them next to my skin, but there's only a limit to how many batteries I could keep warm. But I designed bespoke um, battery covers where I could put those little snap hand warmers into the battery covers, which then kept the batteries warm, and that made a massive difference to performance. Okay, another question um, about the mics that you used when you're out there. So uh, I used a Bayer, uh, one Bayer, which was a backup mic, so you might have seen that um, in, um, um, uh, some of the shots, but principally what I do use, what I was using, is a Sennheiser 8060. Um, it's a fantastic short shotgun mic specifically designed for um, for little cameras, for kind of smaller footprint cameras. And then again, you, I use the trusty Sennheiser 416. You should check out the new compact um, wireless mics from Sennheiser. They don't have additional cables. They dock straight into the XLR um, um, port on the on your camera. And if I'd have had these available then, I would have definitely used these radio mics. But what I did is elect to not take radio mics on this job because of the problem with the cables cracking. So in summary, 8060 and a 416 and you're good. Okay, uh, another one about um, condensation on the lenses when moving from a warm to a cold and the danger of that freezing. So warm to cold is not an issue. Um, keep kit dry, obviously in a warm environment. Yes, if you've got any moisture on your lens, it will freeze. 
What I don't do is have secondary filter lenses over the lens, over the principal lens. You've got an air uh, interface between the manufacturer's lens and the bit of glass that you're putting over. That will be a nightmare. And then also you've got different levels of linear expansivity of the two different materials. So I've had in the past, and I've learned from my own mistakes, I've learned in the past, I've not been able to take those filters off those, uh, those cameras, and it's been a nightmare. I've had to literally smash filters to take them off. And so I never put filters on. The condensation issues occur going from cold to warm. And that's when you will get um, all the kind of moisture in a warm environment condensing out onto a cold item. That's when you've got potential problems of condensation in the electrics. Um, more than happy to answer more questions about the cold, but I think, Rob, it would be pertinent for us to move on, if that's okay. Yeah, that's perfect. There's one or two. Um, I don't know if you could answer this very, very quickly. Um, sure. Someone's asked about, was it Manfrotto head and legs that you were using? Totally, yeah. Right. So, um, uh, on that one, it's got a mid-leg spreader, that shot, uh, for that, that uh, tripod. But what I do now in extreme environments, I don't use spreaders at all. The, such, the locking heads now from Manfrotto, and they're really good. So, Manfrotto are part of the, the Vitec group that make bigger Sachsler, uh Vinton tripods, but Manfrotto are perfect for smaller cameras, um, and spreader less legs, so because the locking mechanism in the head is so good. Yeah, Happy to move on now. Yeah, yeah, let's move on. If, any, if you haven't answered any of the other questions, we'll do right at the end if you've got time. So, yeah, over to you, Phil, for the next section. That's, fun. That's fantastic. So, we've covered cold. So, I'm, I'm introducing the world's fifth highest mountain, Mount Makalu. Um, um, but I'm introducing, not for cold, this is, I'm going to do a section now on high access, so that's working at height, and high risk environments. So not necessarily an extreme hot or cold or high, uh, high, high altitude environment, but an environment that could be post-conflict, that um, could uh, have civil unrest. It's an area or a location that you probably find actually in Europe uh, more often than not these days. So here we've got an image of Mount Maklu, the world's fifth highest mountain, and this is Mount Everest. We, as we know, it's the highest place on our planet. This is the west face of Mount Everest, and I was working on Everest um, for the Discovery Channel and making the most uh, comprehensively <coughs> covered uh, documentary series on Mount Everest ever. We had a team of 15, I was absolutely privileged to be part of this project, and we were shooting a six part series, and I we went right up to the death zone, well in true extreme environments. If you've got a half decent executive producer, and a decent uh, production manager that have an appreciation of the work that you do in these environments, they know it's survival first, then cinematography second. Survival first, cinematography second. By definition, we've got to get the shot, but by definition, you have to come back. And at 8,000 meters, you are literally in the death zone. You spend time there, you're dying. Your body cannot cope with such an extreme environment with so little oxygen. The particle pressure of oxygen is so low. And as you can see there, that little point, that little blimp, that is the summit of Mount Everest from my tent. Um, and I'm one of the few people that it was in my job description not to go to the summit. So I was there to film the people that went up to the top of the mountain returned and I was capturing their stories um, and um, one of the amazing things though when you're working in the mountains or when you're working up a step ladder doesn't matter six foot or six thousand meters it's irrelevant one golden rule gravity always wins 
and so you've got to ensure that all your equipment is safely stowed on you otherwise it's going to come down and hit someone below and here I am working at home in the Alps this uh, I've got a place uh, at the foot of Mont Blanc uh, this is what I love doing and love following friends out in the mountains uh, I'm shooting with a little Canon XF205 and this was a fantastic step up from the 100 and 105 and you might think well again it's you know like a small camera it's, a, it's not a full quality broadcast camera rest assured guys the 205 delivers some awesome results and also you've got to consider the, that camera that mic my spare batteries a DSLR that tripod and everything that I'm carrying there, including my uh, cans, has to go in a rucksack on my back, and then I'm wearing all my safety gear, then I'm wearing my ski mountaineering gear. So that's why I like small, high-quality cameras. It kind of goes with the territory. I couldn't be carrying a shoulder-mounted ENG camera with an HJ11 lens. It just wouldn't work. It would work in those conditions, but it wouldn't work for me to try and ski, climb, mountaineer, and take it to location. And there we've got, talking about gravity winning, we've got Chamonix in the top left-hand corner. The Valley of Chamonix, that is 2,200 meters below me. So all I need to do is slip from where I'm at now, and I will go the full distance. So you've got to have your wits about you. Now, when it comes to having your wits about you, this lady certainly has. And this is who I was filming while I was up there on the summit of the Gui de Midi uh, above Chamonix. <clears throat> this is a woman called Gabby Van der Steen. She is an amazing adventure athlete. And what she does is a thing called speed riding. Imagine taking extreme downhill skiing, combine that with parapunting, and, or, or, or paragliding, shrink that canopy so it's a third if not a quarter of the size and fly off mountains, ski down them and do loop the loops. That's how crazy this pursuit is. And guys, if you're listening to this webinar because of the way that we're delivering it over the net, we're not showing video clips, I will give a list of video clips but most importantly, if you really want to see this girl in action, if you want to find out how uh, I actually did this, I've got lots of behind the scenes stuff, come along to the workshop that we're running at Visuals on a batch, Wednesday, March the 8th. That's just straight after BBE, the week after BBE. And you will get all the lowdown on how to film some of the most, in the most extreme and challenging environments in the world. Now, yeah, this was still pretty extreme, but not that challenging. This was South Africa, um, and I was filming this free climber, Matt Bush. He's totally at the top of his game and can climb safely, overhanging terrain without the use of ropes. But that doesn't mean to say that when I'm filming him, I had to work without ropes. When you're a British-based production company, you with British insurance, you need to adhere to the working at height regulations. What is working at height? Anything over six foot. So if it's taller than you, it's working at height. Doesn't matter. Six foot, six thousand meters. So it's irrelevant. If you go on a step ladder, you're working at height. And this is what I had to do. With respect to Matt, uh, I had to ensure his safety. So I made sure that he was happy um, climbing on this boulder. He climbed it six times. Um, he's climbing without ropes. And as you can see there, I'm safely um, belayed by a climber out of sight. So this was Matt's friend. He's a very experienced and qualified climber. He was looking after me. So I could then look after the shot. And here I'm shooting with a Canon 5D Mark uh, III with a 50mm lens, so I'm using a standard lens for a standard field of view. So I didn't have to look through the viewfinder 
And what I'm doing is holding it on a, a carbon fiber monoprod so it's nice and light. But as you can see, the, even the camera is attached to the monopod. And it's, then the monopod is attached to me and I am attached to a climber who's belaying me. So if I was to drop the monopod, that wouldn't hit anybody down below. It's all a matter of safety, safety, safety. Now, there are, in, in environments like that, you can cover bases. You can do your thing. You can do your due diligence. But when it comes to working in very high-risk environments, working in post-conflict zones, that's different again. That's different again. You can only do so much. And what we did was hire an awesome, a totally awesome fixer. This guy on the left, Hadi, he was our saving grace in Libya. Here we are in Marta Square. Um, and this is where the uh, people of Libya were protesting against Gaddafi. And this is where I was trying to, <laughs> but not too successfully, film... Um, um, trying to be kind of uh, like a tourist, film kind of semi-covert, but this is kind of Heath Robinson version one. And you might remember what I was saying about the Sennheiser uh, microphone receivers. Well, here we've got the original evolution system, and there's cables everywhere. And I have subsequently modified this, working with Sennheiser to be able to kind of get short cables and everything else like that. But their new system now, all it does is dock directly into those XLR ports. It's, a, it's just elegant in its design. It's fantastic. I wish I'd had it then, because at the end of filming this sequence in Marty Square, my presenter, Justin Hall, and I were bundled into an unmarked police car and then taken to the cells. But you know what the great advantage was? In the camera, so in the XF100, I was double slot recording. So what I was doing is simultaneously filming a backup, which in the midst of the commotion, that one of those XF um, C, uh, CF cards went into my wallet so I could hand over the rushes and the camera to the authorities and they were none the wiser. So it's a thing that I always do in conflict zones. And this area here, this has seen some serious conflict. This is Gaddafi's bombed out and burned out palace. Um, and we were walking around there and some areas were still burning. Um, they, it, this place was obliterated off the map. And while I was in Libya, we traveled further south. I do like the little XF100, but you know what? This is for me the kind of smallest real camcorder, because this XF305, it's a workhorse. It's been around for years now, uh, but you know what? Still works well. Still pretty solid. Not the best performer, as we all know, in low light, but damn good and solid and robust. And one thing I love about camcorders. Uh, you can throw them into a kit bag, and when you need to scarper, when you need to move, you can move. And this can go into my camera rucksack, that and a lightweight set of legs, and I'm off. And when I say I'm off, well, I don't normally go and film guys like this. Um, one of the great advantages, our fixer, Haddy, had saved the life of the guy in the bottom left-hand corner, um, the colonel because he was indebted to our fixer, gave us unparalleled access to the rebels that actually overthrew Gaddafi. And here I am on the back of a Toyota Hilux, and we all know from Top Gear how phenomenally robust Toyota Hiluxes are. Well, what the, what the rebels did was spot weld an anti-aircraft gun on the back of one. And you, the observer ones amongst you might notice an elastoplast on the top of that guy's RPG rocket propelled grenade. I don't know what an elastoplast is going to do. That's not going to really protect him, me, or all the people around us. But when I was uh, driving around with these two guys, it was mental. It was one of the most crazy things I've ever done.
yet I can honestly say this was the most extreme and crazy thing. It was bordering on to, this is nuts, we should back off. This guy here is Richard Chackley. He was on Interpol's most wanted list. And the guy on that monitor uh, in the red t-shirt is Victor Bout, who was imprisoned for um, uh, money laundering and arms laundering and Richard Chackley, all you have to do is Google their names, you'll find out what I'm talking about. We were trying to meet up with Richard and Richard was the former manager of Sharjah Airport, the world's number one money laundering centre and, and CITES endangered species trafficking centre. And we were trying to meet him in this place, quite possibly the most dodgy location I've tried to film in in my life. This was a metro station um, on the outskirts of Moscow. And I was filming using a 5D3, um, with, again with a fixed focal length lens, a bit wider this time, and all the uh, cables for my headphones were down my sleeve, my radio mic uh, receiver was down my sleeve, I was wearing a beanie hat, you couldn't tell uh, anything that was going on. I had the camera too close to my chest and I didn't even look through the lens to shoot the entire sequence. But what I did is walk in advance and bit by bit I was able to build a sequence with my presenter and again if you come to the workshop I'll be able to talk you through all these techniques and you'll be able to see the footage that I actually shot on location and it was quite extraordinary. Talking of extraordinary, now I've, I've looked at very specific um, case studies but this is across the board, we all travel to these locations, we all have to get there and what tends to happen from experience, from all the work I've done in the last 25 years, people forget about this. Most accidents happen when people are shifting kit, getting to and from the location. If you don't recognize this airstrip, this is a photograph I took 22 years ago in Luckler. Luckler is the world's most dangerous airport. It is a little airstrip here, it's just, it was dirt, now it's been tarmac subsequently, uh, but this is in the Kumbu region of Nepal, just down from Mount Everest. But that might be the world's most dangerous airport, but these, I can honestly say, are the world's most dangerous machines. Helicopters, I have heard of so many people sadly losing their lives in them, near them, the rotors, downdraft, you name it, they'll get you. And in particular, when I was filming uh, for this production, North Pole Ice Airport for Channel 5, I was thrown backwards, did a backward somersault with a camera on my shoulder. Such was the downdraft from those MI-18 um, helicopters. They are extraordinary. So what I'm happy to do is to <clears throat> take probably one question at this stage, Rob, if we've got anything for kind of general high and high risk environments before I go on to, to hot. Um, yeah, I think someone's been asking about how do you pull focus when operating the camera on a monopod for the climbing sequence? Okay, very quickly on that one, I didn't pull focus, so what I do is set focus. And I, so if we're thinking back to that image, I work through an arc, so if we're looking at a constant radius of an arc, uh, I maintain that radius and therefore I set a focal length and at that instance it was 1.3 meters. I always try and go for the hyperfocal distance of that lens and, and camera configuration, but I was just setting it up for 1.3 meters and ensured that I stayed 1.3 meters away, so I don't need to pull focus. Okay, time for a quick one. There's probably yes or probably. no. Did, uh, did, did you bring DSLRs for the you know cameras for the stills or to film? And how many lenses did you carry? Um, so on that job in Moscow, uh, I used the kit lens, 20, 24 to 105 f 4.5 5.6, um, and it depends. 
Um, if I'm doing principal tele, I'm shooting less DSLR. Uh, if I'm pre if I'm shooting for the web, it depends on the aesthetic. Yeah, sure. all down to the aesthetic Perfect. and the deliverable. So I'll finally go on to the last case study. Yep. I'll finally go on to some uh, a, a dry heat case study. So we've gone from the cold, we've gone to high, we've gone to high risk, uh, super extreme. Personally, I find working uh, in super hot, super dry conditions very challenging. Um, the kit loves it because there's not an issue with condensation. What there is an issue is with dust. You've got the serious problem of trying to keep all your cameras dust free. This is the Mazuga Sands in the Sahara Desert um, of Morocco. And here I was working on an assignment uh, in Oman. And this was a nightmare. This was over 48 Celsius every day. So I'm a member of the exclusive 100 club. I've worked in temperatures down to minus 52 Celsius. And I worked in temperatures above plus 48 Celsius. So the magic 100 degrees of difference. And I can honestly say both are totally hellish. There's, there's no, I can't, I can't dress it up. I, they're just a nightmare to work in. Here we were having ice under our helmets to keep ourselves um, cool. The cameras were overheating. So it's, you're on the edge of what's humanly capable, what's technologically capable. And this limestone pit I was filming and photographing uh, for a petroleum development Oman, they were resurveying their oil reserves. And the white limestone pit simply reflected all the heat back into your face. Um, now, this might not seem that extreme uh, as a story, but it is a quite remarkable story. I'm filming Elmar Sprink, um, a triathlete from Germany. He's no ordinary triathlete. He competes, he trains for world-class Ironman triathlons with someone else's heart. But what we were doing was filming him uh, for this new production, Iron Heart is on a personal quest to be the fittest heart transplant recipient in human history and is on a quest to find out the future of transplantation. And we were filming him in Frankfurt. Frankfurt of all places, you ask. Well, yes, on this crazy day back uh, in July, it was 44 degrees Celsius and we spent 17 hours. So from first thing in the morning to last thing at night, following this guy as he did the triathlon. And people were dying. One guy died, a third of the field didn't finish. People were getting rushed to hospital, left, right and center, and we had to film this. And we were able to film it where we're wearing camelbacks with hydration packs and this special medical gel that was put into uh, vests that we dunked into water and they're called Idenix vests and they cool you off. So it's, it's having an extra cooling layer around your body and this keeping constantly hydrated uh, and wearing these vests and cooling hats enabled us to actually film all day in these unbearable conditions. And I'm saying unbearable, even our Atomos recorders, they failed. They're, they're kind of bomb-proof, they're really robust, but they failed, they couldn't dissipate the heat quick enough. Um, I'm just going to wrap up on a couple of little bits, but if there's any questions over heat, uh, I know we're kind of on on a kind of approaching 45 minutes, but I'm more than happy to, to answer a couple of questions on heat before I do a kind of synopsis on, the, on extreme filmmaking. Perfect, yeah. Um, one one person has asked, with the massive temperature difference, are, are, are there any focus issues on cameras? I guess it being in focus and going in and out because of going into the different temperatures? Uh, absolutely. Uh, it's all to do with linear expansivity. It's all to do with the elements, glass elements, the plastic, the metal uh, in lenses. And yes, you do get certain issues. Um, 
if I'm out of choice and I've got people to carry more kit, uh, I will go with primes. And one thing that I'm doing now uh, on Ironheart, we are we shot that uh, on Canon C100 Mark IIs. I wanted to to use the um, STM lenses so I could get dynamic autofocus on the fly, and um, but I wanted to kind of combine documentary shooting techniques with cinematography shooting techniques. And what we're doing now is to finish this production and shoot all the principal science interviews. Well, I'm shooting with the C300 uh, Mark II. Uh, I, I will use a zoom, the 18 to 80 uh, cine zoom, but I will be principally shooting on prime lenses. Okay. It makes a big difference. It's a big difference. I always use primes in those super dodgy conditions. Okay. Um... Yeah, one person's asked, Tim's asked um, on the Arctic expedition, how quickly can you set you know, yeah, set something up for a shot? Is, is it sort of very time consuming because of the conditions? Um, Tim, what I tended to do was think in advance. So I had a very comprehensive shot list and sequence list. I had stories to, to get each day and it was all about anticipation. Speed is of the essence. So what I did before I went to the Arctic, I went through a number of scenarios and I was operating in a deep freeze. But all my work is based on you know 25 years of being out there at the cold face. So you try and do your bit, you, you, you kind of prepare as much as you can in your mind, but you've just got to be quick. It's that's it, simple as you've got to be prepared, you've got to be slick. Uh, otherwise, you're wasting mental and physical energy on location. Yep. You can't afford to do that. Okay, we've got two more questions very quickly. Um, so you don't use uh, monolithic uh, viewfinders in terms of viewfinders? Um, I tend not to. The thing is as well, I've shot on several times on um, Sony PMW cameras um, for certain productions, the likes of Discovery Channel, I like to spec them. Um, great cameras, however, I just don't, if I've got personal preference, I wouldn't use them. Those viewfinders on the PMWs fog up, freeze up, they get condensations. So I've worked in the cold, I've worked in the heat, and I've worked uh, in very humid conditions. I was filming. Uh, a series for Channel 4 just before Christmas, um, The Island with Bear Grylls, and I was filming for part of the sequences with one of those. Yeah, I couldn't, I was shooting blind, I couldn't see a damn thing. Uh, the, the viewfinder just fogs up, so I, I go for simultaneous shooting on this viewfinder and LCD or OLED, and therefore if one fogs, I can still shoot with the other. Okay, um, this is quite an interesting one. Um, yeah, would you always get a car now, even if you're covert, covert filming? Um, and what do you say to passport control and customs? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, for Russia, we had all the paperwork um, to get into the country with all our kit and we were making a film about aircraft, so that's how we did it. We, we were, it was kind of pretty legit what we were, what we said we were doing. Um, but I'm very much you go on gut instinct. If you're going to go with a story, you use the appropriate tools for the job. So um, it, my gut feel just said shoot DSLR and f let the production manager figure it out with discovery on compliance and everything else like that. At the end of the day, guys, if you get the footage, you get the story, the guys with inky biros looking at waveform monitors, they can take a jump because you've got the stuff from the back of beyond. Sure, and a quick one, I don't know if you're happy to do this, but someone's asked what DSLR would you recommend? Ooh. Well, I can't really, there's a myriad out there, to be fair, but you know what, I can answer that question with what's my favourite DSLR, and it's my total go-to, I've got two of them now, and they're brilliant, 7D Mark II. Reason being, uh, APS-C, uh, 
beautifully compact camera, but they're made of magnesium. So in, imagine a 5D Mark III, their baby brother. Form factor exactly the same, same batteries, but the ace thing is they are optimized for shooting video. And with an SDM lens, they turn into a camcorder. Okay. So <laughs> shall I just finish on a couple of little, little bit of reminders and then we're all good there, Rob? Yeah, that's brilliant. Thanks, Phil. Okay. So back to just a few things that will sum up. Here's just a couple of minutes of, it's pretty damn obvious, guys. Don't forget the paperwork. But most importantly, don't allow the paperwork to run you. I, I run workshops on the culture of health and safety. It should be culture. It's part of your DNA. It's not a box ticking exercise. Whatever your production manager says, ensure that you understand what you're doing on location. Don't forget your paperwork. And most importantly, don't forget your passport. I've worked with a few people. I've got to the gate of Heathrow. And I kid you not, people have turned up without their passports. Get copies put them in the cloud, I have every, all my documents in Dropbox, I can pull them down, they're also on my phone, if, if worse comes to worst, you've got your copies for your runner, I have two British passports as well for multiple visas, so I can get visas while I'm away on location, really important bits of detail. And if anybody asks me what are the most important things to take on a production, I always say a sense of humour and a Leatherman. Don't leave home without them, and don't leave home without the gaffer. Thank you very much. <laughs> That's brilliant, Phil. I really appreciate that. That's been absolutely fa fascinating listening to some so, some great stories and the information you've provided. It's absolutely brilliant. And as Phil has said, um, if you want to know more, if you want to see some of the fantastic footage that Phil's taken over, over the years in some quite incredible places, then come along on the 8th of March and uh, meet uh, Phil in, in person and actually see the footage for yourself. So thanks very much for attending everyone and for joining in and listening. I hope you enjoyed it um, and please come back again when we do some more. So thanks very much and bye for now. <laughs>